Um, how, how do you uh, how do you pray? We had a class uh, in my uh, back there in the, in the fellowship hall back a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, and we spent several months studying the Bible and what the Bible says about prayer and prayer posture and everything about prayer. And uh, I don't know about the, the people who attended the class, but I can tell you as the leader of the discussion, I really blessed. I was blessed and I benefited from it. Now, there's no particular way to pray as far as uh, the exact things that we ought to say. As a matter of fact, guys, those of you who lead prayer, try not to pray the same or the similar public prayer every time. And sometimes you, you just can't help it because there are certain things on your heart. And so basically your prayer sounds about like the last time you led the church in prayer. Now, there's, it's hard to come up with a unique uh, way to say Give thanks uh, over food pretty well. You know, you're just you're thanking the Lord for the food you're about to receive. So it's okay that there's some redundancy there. Um, this year, in my daily Bible reading program, I've been participating in a thing called Five Minutes with God. And it, it comes to my computer at 6, six o'clock each morning. Usually I'll, I'll uh, read it on my iPad, and it'll be a scripture or a passage of scripture. And then there will be some commentary on the scripture and then a challenge to embrace that truth in your life that day. And then uh, it encourages you to pray, specifically about the things that you just were reminded of from, from the Bible, but also just to pray and to spend some time with God. And, and, and I, don't, I can't always do this perfectly, but usually I will uh, do that the first thing when I wake up. And when I pray, the first thing I do is I pray and thank the Lord for the past night's rest. And I thank Him for my life and the fact that I'm, I'm alive. And, uh, and I pray that He will help me and keep me uh, safe when I travel, and that He will protect my health. And then the second thing I pray for, first thing is praying for my life and thanking Him and for the rest and all that. Then I pray for my, uh, I pray for the Lord Jesus Christ. By that I mean I thank the Lord for sending His Son as my Savior. Then I. I ask the Lord, I thank Him for my wife, and I, I ask that He will keep her healthy and keep her safe. And then I start thinking and praying about each of our children, and then our sons-in-laws, or our daughter-in-law. And then I think and pray about each one of our nine grandchildren. And then I think and pray about the Lord who could hear this Christian university, and I pray that He will bless us with abundance. And then I pray for Hickory Known, and I pray for particular people that are on our prayer list. And, I pray for the Chisholm Hills Church, where my wife always is when I'm here with you, and for particular people there. Last Wednesday night, I'm doing a series at Chisholm Hills this month, and um, I haven't been there in a long time, even though we're members there. And so uh, there was this one guy, Mike, who is a big, strong, or used to be big, strong, strapping guy, about 40 years old. Well, Mike's got cancer. And so he, he struggled into the church building and he sat on the back. He just doesn't have any energy. He's undergoing treatments. And I put my hands on his shoulders. He's about a foot tall of me. And I said, Mike, I will pray for you every day. I said, I've already been praying for you. But seeing him, uh, you know, face to face, uh, I knew that he was sick. But it was the first time I'd seen him uh, since the treatment and the cancer had devastated his body. And I put my hand on you. I said, I will pray for you every day. And he teared up and he says, thank you, Dennis, thank you. I said, I will, Mike, I promise. Well, I didn't write it down. And so Thursday morning, first thing, when I started praying, I forgot Mike. But I don't just pray one time a day. And I would encourage you to have a, just an ongoing conversation with the Lord as the day goes on by. Well, it gets on down to about 9 o'clock at night. The day is over for me. And I remember Mike. And I even apologized to Mike in my prayer. And I apologized to the Lord. I said, Lord, I, I'm sorry, but I intended to pray for Mike first thing today. And I prayed that, uh, to the Lord that for him to help me remember. And, of course, I would do better if I would make a prayer list like a lot of people do. And I encourage that, to write down the, the, uh, the list of names. And sometimes if you just look at those names and you scan them, and then you kind of, you know, hold them up to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to pray for each one of these. And I'm asking that you will bless and help me heal each one of these on my prayer list. Well, the Apostle Paul is in jail. And uh, if you want to turn to the book of Colossians, uh, Colossians, um, we're going to look at chapter 1. And while you're doing that, I'm going to turn to the uh, introduction.
introductory page to my Bible. And uh, this is some background information. You may have something similar, I'm sure you do, in your Bible. And it says Paul establishes the church at Ephesus on his second missionary journey. While at Ephesus, he develops a special concern for the church at Colossae, even though he had never visited there. Colossae, once similar to the thriving commercial cities of her neighbors, Laodicea and Hierapolis, is declining. The city is infiltrated with false teaching from the Jews, Greeks, and Orientals. Paul responds to these false teachings, especially that of Gnosticism, which claims secret knowledge and powers that denies Christ's true humanity. Paul sends this letter, the letter to the Colossians, by way of Tychius and the converted slave Onesimus to the church at Colossae, after Epaphras' visit and report on the conditions there. Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon comprise what we call Paul's prison epistles. In other words, uh, letters inspired by the Holy Spirit that Paul wrote while he was in jail. Now with that in mind, let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Verse 3. He says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Now these are people he's never met. He just knows about them and he's praying for them. He says, because, verse 4, we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. Saints means the church. Uh, the, the faith, verse 5, and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. And that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. So that's, that's, that this sets it up. Now here's our text. That's just the introduction to the text. Our text begins in verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. That means he remembers them every day. He's not like me. He doesn't forget a day. Or he doesn't forget when he prays in the morning. He's praying for these folks and he hasn't stopped. And asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Okay, so that's his prayer. And that's the prayer list, you might say, that Paul is, uh, is working through there. And he says, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you every day. And here are some of the things that I'm praying. And so he says, first of all, I'm praying that you will have a spiritual understanding. And he says, uh, I'm asking God, verse 9, to fill you with the knowledge of his will. You know, the scripture says in Hosea 4, verse 6, my people are destroyed uh, for the lack of knowledge. And then notice this about spiritual understanding. I'm reading to you from 1 Corinthians 2, uh, verse 6 through 16. He says, we, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom and a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. These are things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought except their own spirit within them. 
In the same way, no one knows what the thoughts of God are except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. That is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spiritually taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so this is what Paul is praying for. He's praying that the Christians in Colossae will have spiritual understanding. Now he says, there's something else I pray when I, when I pray for you. I pray that you will live a life worthy of the Lord. Verse 10, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Ephesians 4 verse 1, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. See, that's a similar thing that he wrote to the Ephesians. And he says, I'm praying for you in this way. Here's Ephesians 5 verse 8. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. And then 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. And so he said, we need to live in a particular kind of way. Why? Well, because we've been washed, we've been cleansed, we've been added to the Lord's family, and so we need to live like the people that we are. And then he says, and he's already said this earlier in the book of Colossians, in that first chapter. He says that the gospel of Jesus Christ is bearing fruit all over the world. And so now he's saying, I pray uh, that you will bear fruit to the Lord. Now, there is, um, the bearing fruit involves uh, a, a lot of things. And we preachers always say that the fruit of a Christian is another Christian. But uh, anything that we do in service to God uh, that bears some kind of results where God gets the glory, then that's, that's fruit that is born toward God. And so um, he says, bearing good fruit, bearing fruit in every good work. This is Matthew 7, 17 through 19. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then this is John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. And so he's saying, I'm praying that you will stick close to the Lord, remain connected to Him, and that you will bear fruit with your life. And then he says, I'm praying that you will grow in knowledge. Now, this sounds similar to the first prayer where he said, I'm praying that you will grow in spiritual understanding. But really, uh, the scholars say that he's using a different Greek word here. And that is that he's using a word that means, I am praying that you will grow in your knowledge of God. In other words, you will get to know God better. Get to know God better. In verse 10. John 6, 69. But we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God, the people said uh, to Jesus that day. In other words, we have gotten to know you and we realize that you are the Holy One. Galatians 4, verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But he, he says, he goes on to say, but since you have come to know God, and then you are following after the truth that he is giving you. First John 4, verse 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. 
And so Paul prays that they will grow in their relationship with God and in their knowledge of God. And then he says, I'm praying that you'll be strong. He said, you've got to be strong. Now, during the Better Seminar, uh, Howard Norton got up. Uh, anybody know Howard Norton? He was the editor of the Christian Chronicle for years. And, and uh, Eric, you would know him, of course. Um, anyway, he gets up, and uh, this is at the end of the seminar. And they've got three preachers on the stage. Each of them has preached more than 50 years. So there was probably about 160 years worth of preaching experience on the stage. And uh, there was question from the audience, written questions, uh, pre pre planned and submitted to them. And so uh, one of the questions was, what do you do when you have a subject that is unpopular or people don't want to hear about? And so Howard Norton, all three of them addressed that, but Howard Norton in particular got up there and he says, well, he said, as you know, I've always been involved in mission work. And he has. He's been involved in Brazil in particular. Uh, as long as I've known him, and I've known him a long time. And he said, they were told what church he was preaching at in Oklahoma, and he said, there's one guy every Sunday, if he happened to mission, mention mission work from the pulpit or evangelism from the pulpit, this guy would beat him in the back and say, I'm tired of that, I'm tired of that. You just harp on the same stuff all the time. I'm getting tired of it. And so finally it got so bad that this person who was complaining called for a meeting with the elders and with Howard. And so they sit down in you know, some, some classroom or table, uh, some room somewhere at a table. And so this guy just unloads on Howard in front of his elders. And he says, this guy just keeps on talking about mission work and about evangelism. It's like a broken record and I'm tired of it and I want you to make him stop. And before the elders could even respond, Howard said, now brother, I can't not preach on mission work and evangelism. He said, now if I can't do it here, I'll do it somewhere else, but I'm going to talk about evangelism and about mission work because he said, that's, that's what I'm all about. And um, so then he looked at the audience after telling that story, and we were all sitting there. He says, now guys, if you're gonna stay in this business, you've gotta be tough. Well, that's really what Paul is praying for, for all of us Christians. If we're going to remain in the Lord's family, we got to be tough. We got to be strong. We got to stand firm for what we know is right. First Corinthians 15:58, be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Uh, verse 11 in Colossians 1, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Ephesians 6 verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Psalm 31, 24, be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Galatians 6, verse 9, let us not become weary in well-doing or in doing good, as the NIV would say. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Amen? If we do not give up. And then Galatians 6, verse 9, I already read that one. Do not become weary in well-doing. And so he's praying that the, that the Christians in Colossae will remain strong. And then he says, I'm praying that you will hang in there, be patient, and, and, and endure whatever you have to endure in order to win the prize. What's the prize? Eternal life. He says, I'm praying that you'll stick with it. Colossians 1, verse 11. So that you may have a great endurance and patience. Hebrews 10, verse 36. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. Persevere, do the will of God, and receive what He has promised. And then there's Romans 12 and 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. And then the, that word joyful brings us to the next prayer. Paul says, when I pray for you, those of you in Colossae, I pray that you will be joyful and thankful. This is verse 12. He says, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Psalm 107 verse 22 says, let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. And then Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. 
And again I say, rejoice. Well, you say, I don't know what to pray for. When I pray, I can't come and think of anything to pray for. Well, just go to Colossians chapter 1 and see some of the things uh, in this list of ingredients of a prayer. See some of the things that the Apostle Paul is praying. And he's praying for the Christians in Colossae. But you see, the Word of God is written so that it applies to all of us. So uh, it's all, the prayer is also intended for us. So we can pray this prayer for ourselves that we'll be strong and thankful and joyful and patient. And we can pray this prayer for each other as individuals. And we can pray this prayer for Ikranol as a congregation, that we, will, that we will meet these standards, each and every one of them. And so let me encourage you to enjoy talking to the creator of the universe, to God Almighty, who is keeping you uh, alive at this very moment. Well, the plan of salvation is on the screen, and I think most everyone in this audience knows well the plan of salvation. But just know that God wants to save us. He wants to forgive us our sins. And if we will receive the grace, the mercy, the love, and the forgiveness that he's offering us through Jesus Christ, his precious son, then we can have all our sins forgiven and be prepared to be with God forever in heaven. As a believer, uh, repenting of sin, confessing our faith in Jesus, and receiving baptism for forgiveness of sin, being added to the church and committed to remaining faithful the rest of our lives. If you're a Christian already and you've, you have obeyed these steps of the plan of salvation and yet you don't feel as close to the Lord as you know you ought to be, then why not take this opportunity tonight and ask your church family to pray with you and for you and that you will be restored to a close relationship with the Lord. You may need, need to repent of some specific things. And by the way, when I say repent of specific things, if, if folks in the church don't know what you're repenting of, you don't need to tell them. You don't need to feel obligated to say, well, I'm repenting of this exact sin and this one and this one. No, just say, brethren, I've come to repent tonight. I need to repent. And I want to confess that I've sinned. And I need forgiveness. And I want to be restored to a safe, safe relationship with my Father. And I'm asking you as my brethren to pray for me. And the scripture teaches in Acts chapter 8, there's a principle there. That if we will pray, the Lord will forgive us. And so tonight, if you are not a Christian, then you need to receive baptism for forgiveness of sin. If you're already a Christian, but you're not right in the sight of the Lord, you need the prayers of the church as you pray yourself. So whatever your need may be, we encourage you to come right now while together we stand and sing.